All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for coming to the Crocker Art Museum today, this evening. Um, my name is Holly Gillette, I, and I am the manager of mobile programs down in Los Angeles at LACMA, the LA County Museum of Art. And um, myself and one of my colleagues, Michael Fritzen, down in Los Angeles, is your um, EDCOM regional rep. So that is the American Alliance of Museums, has a professional network just for educators, museum educators. And so um, we are your regional representative for the Western region, um, which includes lots of states on the West Coast, including Alaska and Hawaii. Um, so every year we put together a, a program called One Good Thing, which is a peer-to-peer -peer professional development program in person. Um, and so this is our One Good Thing event today here in Sacramento. So thank you so much for joining us. So just a quick note um, that we are recording this. So it is gonna go up on our website uh, later on. So um, if, you know, during any moment here, uh, if during the uh, Q&A section you don't want to be in the video, please let us know and we can edit you out, okay, at the end. Um, I also want to acknowledge that the Crocker Art Museum is on the traditional land of the Patuan and Nisian people, and California is the homeland of many tribes. We are honored to be here today and acknowledge our responsibility to these native nations and our commitment to work with them as we move forward as an inclusive institution. I also want to thank the Crocker Art Museum for being our host and Stacy Shelnut Hendrick here um, for being a collaborator and a thought partner in building this panel today. So thank you, Stacy. <laughs> Um, so also a quick note to um, everyone in the audience and also the speakers today to make sure to use the mics um, because we, we are uh, recording. Uh, so our one good thing is focusing on art mix. So I would like to uh, show the video to start us off, to give a little taste. Um, I will say that that art mix was actually one specific art mix, art mix prom, where people got to come back to their, um, relive their prom. And it was actually one of my favorite moments at that art mix was a woman who was wearing the prom dress she wore 30 years ago. Wow. It was, that was a really lovely moment. She said, I can fit, I can fit. And then, like, so funny, I kept telling that story all night, and all the um, ladies were saying, and she can fit it, and all the men were saying, and she can still find it. It was, like, two different <laughs> things. <laughs> But um, it's you know somewhat representative of art mix, and we've been doing art mix now for about um, nine and a half years, and so we're really happy to um, have an exploration and a conversation around it. Great, thank you. And also after this panel presentation, uh, you'll have the opportunity to experience art mix this evening, which is really exciting. So um, I'm actually going to give the mic over to this lovely panel up here. And first, I want to introduce our uh, moderator for the evening. So I'm going to go sit in the back um, in a minute. But um, our moderator for this one good thing, and I'm going to read this because I want to make sure I get it correct, um, is Ileana Maestas. Um, she is an associate park and recreation specialist at the California State Parks and works 
uh, cultural resource preservation. Prior to her current position, she was a curator of the State Indian Museum for eight years. She did her undergraduate work at UC Berkeley and received her master's in anthropology from Sac State. She is a board member of the California Association of Museums and vice president of the West Sacramento Historical Society. Uh, she grew up with parents who love to travel and drag their kids to historic sites, zoos, aquariums, and museums. So it's a no-brainer uh, that she ended up where she is today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Holly. Um, just to let you know, too, my brother also ended up in the museum field. So my parents are two for two. Um, so good evening, everyone. We are here at the Crocker Art Museum for EDCOM's One Good Thing program, which, as Holly mentioned, is a national series of conversations connected to the best and next practices in museum education, which for us includes museums of all disciplines, historic sites, zoos, aquariums, and botanical gardens. Today, our backdrop and point of inspiration is Crocker's Art Mix program, which is a monthly art party that mixes art education and entertainment targeting non-traditional visitors. Programs like Art Mix and Fridays Night and Friday's Nights Out at the Oakland Museum are very common these days, but they take many shapes and forms and through common and though commonplace, still have core groups of proponents and critics in the museum world. Um, today we already. Today we have invited a great group of ladies, of panelists, to discuss how and if programs like Art Mix animate the museum bring relevance, engagement, and connection to today and tomorrow's museum audiences. To explore this topic, we have with us uh, Cynthia Taylor, Associate Director of Public Engagement, Oakland Museum of California. And Cynthia, can you give us two sentences about you? Oh, yes. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I've been at the Oakland Museum of California for about nine and a half years. I've been working as an arts and cultural and community engagement administrator for almost 30 now. And uh, I'm a Bay Area girl, a California girl. Um, I founded, I'm a founding uh, programmer for Friday nights at OMCA. And I am very proud to be on this panel today and talk about this with you and to support all of our development. And I want to give a shout out to Evelyn Orantes in the audience, who was also a key partner in developing our evening program that we'll talk about later. Um, I was also a horse vaulter. Uh, we also have Jamie Yar, who's the associate curator here at the Crocker Art Museum, and why don't you give us two sentences about you? Yeah, very excited to be here at the Crocker. I've been here for a whole month now. Um, very fantastic. I've been in the curatorial field about 15 years at museums in California, Washington State, New Hampshire, um, and doing quite a bit of university teaching over the last six years as a professor um, in Minnesota as well. Most recently, designing um, and implementing graduate and undergraduate museum studies programs. So I come from uh, that side of the education world. And when I came to the Crocker, I made Stacy promise that I could be an honorary member of the education department. Next, we have Ann Brown Crawford, Executive Director of the California Arts Council. Hi. So I, um, and, and it's Brown Crawford, just, so in oh, ca sorry. just in case, I'm not criticizing you, but if anyone tries to email me and you put the brown in there, <laughs> just recently, <laughs> it'll bounce. You won't find me. Um, so I've been in this role for two years. I'm still shiny. But I've been in this field of um, arts engagement and um, art creative education, and you know, the, just this whole rich stew uh, ecosystem that we live in for the past four and a half decades. So I'm, this is a just right on that trajectory. Um, you want two sentences of what I do? Okay. So I, I am in, I'm the head of the state's only arts agency. So we're government. 
which is an interesting position to be in. I think it's lovely because we use taxpayer money to nourish arts and culture throughout the whole state of California to serve all populations, regardless of ethnicity, um, culture, race, geography, um, whatever. Our task is to cover the whole state. And it's a beautiful challenge. And my whole staff and council take it on um, willingly with a lot of energy. And our host over here, Stacy Shelnut Hendrick, uh, Director of Education here at the Crocker Art Museum. So I've been at the Crocker um, for more than a minute now. And uh, I have uh, enjoyed every minute of it, though. I, before being at the Crocker, I was at the Studio Museum in Harlem. I was at the Brooklyn Children's Museum. I was at the Baltimore Museum of Art. And I was executive director of the Star Spangled Banner Flag House Museum. And so I've been in museums for a very long time. And throughout my career, I have always focused on um, civic engagement, building museums that could have as many people as possible in it, looking as brown as I am, having various socioeconomic backgrounds, having different interests. Um, I'm also really interested in how museums can um, redefine themselves. And so I'm really excited to be on this panel because I know all these people are doing similar work in their, their realms. And so excited. Thank you. Okay, so our first question, um, how are museums exper experimenting with engagement and why? And I'm going to direct this to Anne. Um, you have a broad view of cultural organizations throughout California. How do you see museums and similar cultural organizations experimenting with engagement? And Jamie, as a museum studies professor, what do you see more globally? Well, it, you know, we, we view museums as cultural hubs, and that, that's different in a lot of different organizations. I printed out just for this year how many organizations we give money to that are, call themselves museums, and how many different ways they utilize that money. They uh, apply for it. And it's all over the map, from arts engagement for kids. Kids get bust to institutions like this. Museums provide outreach out to students. In a, in a broader sense, I, I see museums playing the similar role that libraries play in a, in a community as they, they become a hub, a home, a connector um, for a community, for all things cultural and all things art and creativity. And so we're very open to say, I mean, we have cultural districts, and I'll talk about that more later, where museums actually sit in the center of those districts and provide a, a centralized uh, part of the network um, to the, a museum out in, in the high desert, which is, you know, the only game in town. And so uh, having the ability to help fund, and yeah, its budget does, but... I got it, you know, I've got a couple council members that'll say, why are we just giving out two or three thousand dollar grants? I'll tell you that if you're in the high desert, three thousand dollars goes a long way and they know how to how to uh, turn that into a, a lot more than just the dollar amount. So, you know, th that's what museums are for us is is that kind of center of things. Um, I think in terms of sort of some broad trends that I've seen in the last few years, in terms of programming specifically, acknowledgement of privilege in the museum world and how important that is in terms of collaboration. I don't think you can collaborate without acknowledgement of privilege, and I've seen museums doing better with that, um, both, both in terms of how they approach exhibitions, but programming specifically. Um, empathy has become another sort of key trend, I would say, in the last two years that I've seen. Centers for empathy, programming around empathy, um, meditation, slow art, spending time with works, and really thinking about where we're centered in sort of our um, American moment, so to speak. I've seen museums responding to that. Um, in terms of kind of art mix programming, so these sort of like fun night kind of party events, I've seen them grow, maintain, but also include an emphasis on doing while you're at the event. So not just drinking, dancing, 
hanging out, but doing something. Um, the Minneapolis Institute of Art has a great third Thursday event, very similar to Art Mix, um, but there's always a doing involved. Um, they do a competition, I think it's every year or every two years, that's sponsored by uh, Corporate 3M, but it's a technology-related competition. Uh, so it's related to the museum, um, 3M sponsors it, and it's a competition to design something technology-based for the museum, and the winner gets to actually create that thing and implement it. And one year it was a technological divining rod that took you through the museum based upon your preferences for different artworks. And they implemented that at one of their art mix style events, which was really great in sort of the scavenger hunt type way. Um, I've also seen a lot of emphasis on um, art museums specifically looking towards zoos, botanical gardens, and history societies for inspiration with regard to family audiences and young audiences. So how can the zoo, which is a very typical place to take your family or young child, inspire the art museum? And the zoos have done a great job of extending that into their websites and their sort of post-programming engagement. Um, and I'd love to see art museums maybe do a little more of that in my ideal world. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, these programs have fierce camps of critics and proponents. Uh, for those out there who believe firmly that the primary role of museums is education, and these events are not educational, focusing on social activities and, inter and entertainment and devi deviating from this core purpose, how, how would or do you respond? So I'm going to start with Ms. Stacy. Sure. They're definitely education. I mean, I wouldn't be doing it because I have enough to do if they weren't education. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so they're um, different types of education. They're not formal education. And I think um, when people started using the term of informal um, cultural sites, um, for some reason, art museums got sort of like, I want to say left out of the mix, um, and particularly as we talk about adults. And so um, we really um, work hard, and you'll see when you go out to Art Mix Grimm, um, make sure that there's these moments where we highlight the collection, that we're always engaging people um, in conversations about the collection. We're making sort of these um, wonderful, and they're making wonderful connections between their life and the, collect, connect, the collection or the theme. And so um, we really do focus on education. So I would disagree with those critics. Yes, yes, we're holding you accountable for this question. Um, wow, it is so educational. <laughs> um, I'll put it in terms of audience development. We have a society um, and uh, an education system that is, uh, and a family structure and economy that is not necessarily grooming every generation to enjoy institutions at the same level. And some institutions, including museums, are based on a different type of hierarchy in colonization America, in colonized America, um, that is starting to be acknowledged. There is an acknowledgement known and unknown, right? Sometimes people are like, yeah, yeah, I heard that. And they're not quite sure, but we'll get there, right? We're all from the same society. We're all on the same path. Um, but there's another, another way of reaching people that may not know that the museum is for them or may not have actually have family that invested in the objects in which are holding down the history of our culture. So this way, we are broadening from all different angles, in my opinion. This means it's not just... Uh, leadership decisions and funding decisions. These are community decisions to hold this space sacred, to enjoy this space, and to own the space. At the Oakland Museum of California, we opened up literally 50 years ago um, with a very strong charge and tagline of Museum of the People. And that's 50 years that you have to keep working on how do you keep that? How do you earn that? And as consciousness changes, it, 
then the methods in which you engage people have to change. So informal education is, you, you don't have to take all your vegetables, you can saute them a little bit, right? So there's different <laughs> ways of getting the things you need or that the society needs. I see this as an incredible invitation to open up a, a, a club that may have only been for a certain portion of society. And it's a, I'm passionate about it, I'm excited about it. It's, um, so, you know, if you're raised around a campfire, it's very natural for multi-generational uh, groups of people to be sitting there talking and telling their stories and passing down the knowledge. And you put a campfire with the right fire regulations in a museum <laughs> outdoor space, the same thing happens because it's primal. You have shelter, culture, entertainment, it's already built and it's on the tax land. It, this is our land, right? So it's a way of inviting and all being together. And once all together in community on site, then you get to share the assets of that building and that institution and that art collection. Or at the Oakland Museum of California, we have art, history, and natural science collections, um, multidisciplinary, and then an enormous outdoor space. And you have a beautiful outdoor space here at the Crocker. Um, so I see it as informal education. I see it as audience development. I also see it as sustainable practices that are, uh, one, more mature in our understanding of how our country was built and um, the choices we have right now and where we're going. I also see it as an opportunity for uh, multiple revenue generating opportunities to s support sustainable business practices and keep these institutions uh, growing and serving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just want to um, support Cynthia because as we talk about the creative economy, um, Cynthia at Oakland has does a, an amazing job sort of quantifying the impact that their Friday Nights Out program makes. Um, and I think um, we need to talk about that more, just sort of how the impact of these types of programs actually not only educationally wise, but also just economic impact within a community. I think part of the I think part of the question asked about um, mm, 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 from the roles focusing on social activities with such disdain and entertainment and deviating from the core purpose. Okay, so I wanted to touch base on that, and that is it's in the data. So it, whatever you are uh, working on, you track everything. You track the garage intake. You track the gallery admission, right? So you're, you're tracking the normal things a business does. You track the numbers and the money. At, the muse at OMCA, we are tracking the social impact as well because it's a free event and people can self-select to buy a ticket to go into the gallery. So if I have a record of 15% conversion of everyone who's just hanging out choosing to buy a ticket to go into the gallery, then in the world of measurements and data, then I'm asked, okay, let's grow that conversion rate. What's the loyalty ladder? People come, right? So you put some honey at the, outside the doors of the museum. For people who don't think they like, they don't even know if they like museums and they just don't. And we're competing with a couch, quite honestly, as well, right? Um, there's a lot to choose from. So everyone wants to eat. And so my methodology, my strategy in this area was it, food trucks were very popular. It was, winning for, uh, it was a winning uh, uh, play for other people. And it was a way of diversifying the food offerings and actually just supporting the data that our families want more quality time together, that people are working multiple jobs. That why is the museum only open while I'm at work? Right, so all these things led up to all these other programs. So many people are trying to serve the people that they, 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 they want to serve, and then we're also reaching to invite new people. And so if you bring the food in, you bring in a draw, somebody maybe with a bigger social media platform than your museum does. Uh, in our case, it was off the grid. So you're inviting people to come eat, and they're right up against the museum, and to this day, we still have people out there on the street who don't know where they are. And, well, they know they're in Oakland. I mean, in Oakland. No. Oh, no, they don't. They, they stand, they're having a great time. They hear the music, right? I, put, I strategically put the music on a bridge in the amphitheater from the street into the museum. I strategically put the bar at the bottom of the stage so that when people say, oh, that's live music, you come around the corner. You see people on the stage. Oh, that's, the, that's our neighbor. These are local artists on the Go Local stage. 
Is that a bar? And they take a step down. Next thing you know, you're wondering, where am I? Right? So imagine the meetings. We don't, but imagine the meetings to discuss signage. Where does the banner go? Why do I see pictures on Facebook and I see the concrete? I recognize the concrete, but it doesn't say where this musician is or where this art activity is. So there, this is where you get to geek out on business, sustainable business practices, the art of invitation, and the art of sharing all the assets you have at your institution. It's so fun to troubleshoot the most ridiculous problems that are like, no one would open their doors without having these things solved first. So how much fun is it to pilot and stumble and figure it out, and then have to convince people that it's a good idea. Well, it worked for Starbucks, maybe we should try it, uh, right? And we can eliminate that particular issue. But you have to get people on board if they are all trained in a particular industry, right? So these programs disrupt the way business is done. So that's where the data is really our friend. I'm sorry, I, sorry, I just started going there. Well, I, I also think, so I had, since I forgot to eat lunch, which is a systemic problem with me, I had one of those fortune cookies out there, and maybe they all say the same thing, but no. the, the, it, different custom ones. It, it says, you have always belonged. Well, I think this is the task of um, museums in this day and age, is to, how do you engage everyone in the community so that they see themselves here in this institution and they feel like they belong here. I, I think that that's, it, in some cities it's Herculean, in other cities it's not. I mean, I've, I've danced at the Friday night things, I've danced here, uh, Chicago where I grew up has a similar kind of thing going on and then you just move on to Millennium Park and keep on going with the party, but it brings people in who don't feel like they belong in a museum. Mm -hmm. And you do it from kids in educational component, um, it, uh, curriculum, all the way through docent-led tours for adults, through, you know, just come on in and dance. And in, including, uh, you know, a lot of things that we've done in the past couple of years is we've had, you know, parts of our convenings or events come here and we'll have meetings and breakout sessions. And by the way, just walk around the museum when you take a break. Yeah, I have a, a meetings quite often by saying, just meet me down at the Crocker and we'll walk mm -hmm. through the galleries and talk. Um, it's, it's necessary to get people to feel like they belong here because this really is their museum. I, I'm so, I, I, <laughs> I, must, I must comment. I want to loop back to data and really reflect on what you just said because all of these programs, and let's talk about Art Mix because that's why we're here. Art Mix and Friday Nights at OMCA and a lot of these ventures outside of the normal museum programming or, nor, or the traditional educational programming are all a reflection of the communities that we serve and we want to serve. These are all educational practices of, oh, students need computers. Let's look for funding, let's build a computer lab because we have this room and we have outlets. Or we have a room full of computers, right? So you look at what resources you have, you study and find out what, does your, what do the communities need. Uh, and any education program is a response to a need. And these programs are a response to a need. So they are, they are built on educational practices uh, that are honed and so important to museums and now shared on a much larger level through things that our communities want, which is some social quality time together in a place that, that they feel, they, they start feeling their civic rights. They start feeling their civic ownership and belonging. It's, it's a response and it is purely out of the, the, the strength of educational practices to give what is asked for. And just to piggyback on that, I would say Cynthia too, it's about community needs in terms of how individuals think about themselves and how they identify as groups. And that's not always the boxes we see on surveys or the ways that evaluations are reported. Um, it's socially, how do we see ourselves? What are our likes or dislikes? Um, who's our community? Who are our friends? And I think events like this can bring people together sort of across those demographic boxes that we so often use. Yeah. And I think that's what's really exciting. It's also a form of collaboration, as Cynthia said, and Anne said. Um, it's 
that's a big trendy word in the museum world for the last few years as well. And, and we often think about that with advisory councils or curatorial work, but it's collaboration with restaurants and um, sort of other tourist attractions, performing arts, um, music, you know, other spoken word artists and things like this. And I think oftentimes the critics of these types of events, critics of um, the sort of party events or the entertainment events forget that this is a form of collaboration and it's also kind of collateral for the museum, so. Yeah. Thank you. So um, how are you measuring engagement or the general success of these events? Well, I, th I think Cynthia said, um, talked a little bit about it in the sense of measuring, you know, from parking revenue to cafe revenue. Um, we do a, sort of demo a lot of demographic surveying because we are very concerned that the attendance at Art Mix reflects the city and reflects um, particularly the generations coming up. Um, traditionally, and you know, studies have shown museums tend to have, um, you know, white, richer, um, wealthy, well-educated um, attendees, and we want to change that. And so we're looking at all those um, demographic areas. And then we're also measuring success in the way that we collaborate and how many groups um, come to us versus us going to them. You know, we used to sort of have to really explain what we were trying to do and where we were trying to go and how we worked. And now, you know, people sort of appreciate and understand um, what the Quacker is about and what we value. And we value really being in partnership with our community and working in a way that we co-create not only art mix, but the things that we're doing in the community. And so having um, those collaborations be very authentic and very real and based on a um, not uh, what we can get from you type of um, scenario, but what we can do together is how we measure success, I think. That's so great. Um, I'm wondering if at the Crocker you've, you've had artists um, or people acknowledge that they thought museums were only for uh, dead acknowledged artists, right? And that all of a sudden we're, these evening programs start featuring living artists at all stages of their of their career, um, and it it makes the whole building alive, and it's shaking up uh, perceptions or stereotypes of of museum. Um, one of the other ways that we uh, measure at the Oakland Museum of California is we now uh, measure social impact. So we did some unpacking of how do we uh, they people seem happy. Um, we studied happiness measurements. In, um, in England, there's a whole department that studies happiness. There's a happy app. Uh, the county of Santa Monica actually has a whole department in their city to, to check the well-being of their citizens. So we pulled a convening of all these people that measure happiness, all these different ways of trying to understand um, what we're seeing and feeling of people. Oh, that's, oh, that's okay. I'll tell you, that's my staff. Um, and so what we did is we really worked hard to try to figure out, well, what, what's a problem and what are our resources at the museum? What can we do about these problems in society, right? So we really broke it down to the social fragmentation that was happening in the most diverse city in California, if not further than that, where um, our city is so very diverse and still living uh, from the repercussions of redlining and, um, and under enormous... Uh, waves of, of gold rush uh, gentrification, just an, an enormous amount of money uh, flowing into the area, right? So we wanted to uh, measure and acknowledge and respect that not everything can be measured in money and numbers. It's so hard. So the Friday nights at OMCA was leading the charge in terms of diversifying our audience. And now the, the people who buy tickets for the galleries are now not so different from the people that are on site and not buying tickets. Our diversity is now more reflecting our census. We are not linked to the census because our census is going to change with gentrification. And we are very committed to people of color and we're very committed to uh, people in our low income neighborhoods that are right next door. So to give you some perspective, in 2010, only 15% of our neighbors knew the museum was there. That's a club, right? And so I wish I had the, the follow-up data on that, but it's bigger than that now. Um, so what I want to tell you, though, about social impact was in order to um, see what we could do to support uh, so, uh, and 
change social fragmentation and bring social cohesion, we created our social impact measurements. And basically, through our um, exit surveys, we're, we are tracking our visitor satisfaction. And there are a few things we ask. Um, we want them to reflect that at OMCA, I feel welcome. So everything is looked through the lens of, is this a welcoming act? Is this radically welcome? Is this hospital, hospitable? I see my stories reflected, right? Who wants to go someplace where you don't exist? I mean, really. I connect with other people. I express my ideas and I'm open to those of others. Now that's a big one, I know, for the United States. And I know it, it's, it's go time right now on what we're gonna do about that in our country. Um, but these, these ways of measuring and these ways of asking and saying, like, did you enjoy your time? You know, sometimes you're like, oh, did you have a good time? Are you happy face? A thumbs up, thumbs down. But it's, did you feel welcome, right? So these are the ways we are now tracking the social cohesion that we're inviting. And I can only tell you what it looked like in the Friday after the 2016 election. Everyone was rocking around with their arms out and their chest out going like, this is America. I mean, everyone was walking around like, everyone was in shock, but everyone was really arms out just in loving seeing each other together. It is, it is Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. It is the Sesame Street song. You see the mailman. You're seeing old friends run into each other. Um, it's the town square. It's the front porch. It feels, it's a moment to rest um, in community. Um, so these, our social impact is another way in which we are measuring in addition to the financial and the um, traditional measurements of, of all the, eth, you know, diversity, all of it. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you because we've worked on it for years. Um, and uh, many generations of staff have been a part of how to measure this and how we can contribute back to our society through uh, the way in which we program. And I, I wonder, you know, measurement and assessment of this is difficult because it, it, it's hard to measure, um, measure how people's value systems are changing. And one, one of the things that we have are uh, cultural districts yeah, yeah, there are 14 of them throughout the state where we uh, have designated districts to, um, to highlight cultural assets. And in several of them, museums sit in the middle of it. And they, they have become very um, important parts of the whole cultural and artistic ecosystem in that region. And so that means a lot of different things. It means boosting economic development. It, it means um, creating a more resilient community. It, it, it means um, a, 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 just a, a better, um, kinder climate, social climate in those areas. That those are things that are often difficult to measure, but you can feel them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we we're always looking for proper ways to measure all that. You know, I, I can look and see well who's applied for what grants, who are we giving grants to, who's who are we, in terms of museums themselves. I just I've spent a couple of days evaluating all of how we've been funding museum work and. A, Natu the natural fit is through arts education, and that's natural. But then I also w was discovering that there are a few, and they, they link up with our cultural districts, where we're funding their um, need to rebrand, and their need to, to reach out into the community, and their need to really do in-depth evaluation and studies, and, and to put strategies in place to bring communities into them. It, it, places like uh, Lancaster Museum of Art. It's a high desert. They, they are a community center now. The same with Oceanside Museum of Art. And that um, at cultural district, Little Tokyo, has two. They've got the Geffen and the Japanese American National Museum. Uh, Eureka up in Humboldt County has a Mor Morris Graves Museum. It, it, Balboa Park, more than one museum in there. And, and they are becoming community centers. They're having poetry out loud in there. They're, they're um, doing um, all sorts of different things according to what their regional needs are. 
And our task now as an agency is to figuring out how to evaluate and measure that, seeing, doing a gap analysis so we can help fill in the blanks. Who's, who's having the big parties? And how, how much of an impact does that make? And how many different people do those events-oriented things bring people in? It, I'm always looking for, for, for strategies that really, truly measure that well. So keep in touch. I have the mic. <laughs> and I think um, one of the things that like, maybe we'll never be able to measure is, I know people have, have said, um, because of their experience at Art Mix, their whole affinity to Sacramento has changed. You know what I mean? Coming to maybe a new city and then being integrated or experienced in Art Mix has allowed them to appreciate and bond with um, Sacramento in a way that um, they needed to at that time. And so those are things that, you know, I had a conversation, and then that person left, and then you know, how do you measure those types of things, which are really yeah. challenging? It, it, oh, sorry, you're no. next. <laughs> and that actually, Art Mix served that purpose for me. Aww. Like See, that's, that's when I started. <laughs> <laughs> that's when I started to feel at home here in Sac. Just some quick kind of like boots on the ground type thing. Um, in terms of tracking and demographics and surveys, I think we all have survey fatigue. You get one for absolutely everything you do now. Um, so I've, I've found that one of the best things that I've seen and some of the trends are really short in-person surveys when they come in the door. Two questions, do you see yourself here? Will you come back here? and ask that as they come in and ask as they leave. And what's the difference after you've experienced literally one event over the course of two hours? Um, free, free memberships is another huge trend that I've seen and that helps to sort of track individuals who might not um, be able to or are not willing to pay for sort of these high level memberships, but they're a way to show a dedication to the community, to the city, to sort of collaborative efforts and want to be involved. Um, and I think that's really fantastic too for younger audiences, um, for sort of a, a vast array of individuals. So that's another strategy that could come out of something like Art Mix as well. I'm um, sort of like, hey, you just had an awesome party, you wanna sign up for a free membership. Um, not just give your email, because that is pretty boring and you feel like you get bombed with that all the time. But a free membership that has some benefits to it that makes you really actually part of the community of the museum that you're at. I'm having a, a reaction to the word party <laughs> because it sounds frivolous. Mm -hmm. And it's, we've all, we all use it um, and we all like a good party. Um, and because it is so fun and is so engaging, it, it sounds like a party, right? But it's really quite, deeper than that. It is all, every moment of it is carefully curated to introduce you to an exhibition, an object, your, this, your civic surroundings, the architecture, the community, each other. It, there's the layers of engagement are so exciting. Um, it's a different, it's, for me it's a different kind of party. Um, but at, yes, the enjoyment level and also the performing arts, right? I've always, Sometimes you see something, you're like, it, this needs a soundtrack. It's so beautiful, you know. Um, and we have all these living artists, right? So introducing the performing arts is a very party-like feeling. Um, and I'm not saying it's not party fun. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge the, the, the depths of and the strategies, the museums now marketing more like any other business, um, and the staff alone being repulsed, right? Like, wait, well, now we're just like, wait, wait, who are those, who are the people in that picture? Right, it's like, well, that, those people are at the event. This is not a model, right? You're not being tricked. Um, uh, so it, it's very interesting, the internal tension over um, a, a posse of people that have chosen art for art's sake Right, and then feeling the revenue goals, feeling the business strat strategy alone, it feels a little. It, it makes you feel like you're not being on the authentic go with the flow, right? But there's a lot of investment going into this, and if you do it right, you're like Oz behind the curtain. If you do it right, then everyone can enjoy it, 
it can be a party, and the people who don't work on it can really enjoy it as well. But you know the mastermind of how you are reflecting the needs of your community, using the resources of, of, of your organization in new ways that can threaten the, the, the power source of that institution. So these conflicts are gonna come up and we're gonna keep judging ourselves, like, are we really going in the right direction? Do we really wanna just be a party host? And you know, I've, I've gone to parties that rent out a museum and th that's not what art mix is and that's not what Friday nights at OMCA is. But I do love that a party has a very <laughs> positive feeling and just so we'll keep the word. Yeah, um, and just to, uh, I think one interesting thing about the word party actually is that it breaks an art museum stereotype and it breaks a history museum stereotype where you're supposed to be quiet <laughs> all the time and, and be quiet and you know be, be studious and those sorts of things. It's still, it's still the number one stereotype um, every, every generation. Art museum, you have to be quiet. I have to know art to go there. Um, and I think art mix and re, you know, related uh, programming is essential in breaking that stereotype. Yeah. We could go on forever here, I know. We didn't even get to all the questions, but I want to make sure that if there's any questions out in the audience, we can get those addressed. Hi, my name is Ariana, and I work at uh, Verge Center for the Arts. We're a nonprofit, just actually a couple blocks away. And I have a question. I feel like there's more funding opportunities to do programs like this than opportunities to get funding to put evaluation methods in place, to have a better understanding of who your audience is, who your audience isn't, and so on. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas for free or potentially inexpensive ways to, I don't know, bring in consultants, bring in resources to put those evaluation methods in place, whether you're at like a nonprofit or maybe an underfunded museum? I, I'll just say that the California Arts Council is very interested in people um, who, are in, who, who want to do assessment and evaluation. So give me a call and I'll send you to the right person. To <laughs> Um, I just wanted to add to this, uh, coming from the university world, I've been a huge advocate of museums tapping into college classes to do work for you. Um, university professors and students are looking for real world experience. And I'm not just saying museum studies or art history students. Go to the business school and say, my nonprofit needs a marketing plan, or we need an evaluation plan, or we need a financial plan. Can your senior class or graduate level class take on this project this semester, you will have 20 to 50 students invested in doing this for you in a three month period. Um, and I've desperately tried to do that from the university side, but you need the museum to kind of meet you halfway um, and professors love for you to reach out. <laughs> so that would be a, a sort of plug for that, that option. And Luckily, here in Sacramento, we have some really fantastic uh, schools in our vicinity. And of course, the same in most, uh, most locations in California, certainly. Um, I'll leave it there. Okay. Else? We had some slides, and I want to let everybody, because people gave their slides, so just really quickly, maybe just riff off your slides, and we'll just be real fast. Oh, that's me. Okay. San Diego Zoo. I'm a San Diegan, um, so I'm a little biased there, but they have, this is their kids' website, purely for kids, and as a parent myself, I cannot tell you how many hours I have spent on this website with my kid, um, and she's little, and just the idea of engaging with zoo concepts and even an idea of conservation with a toddler, but you can talk about that concept. Um, it's user-friendly, it's easy, there's lots of images, art museums, please do this. <laughs> Help us introduce art museums or history museums to kids from a really super early age. Um, Brooklyn Museum, I think always a model for um, being on the pulse. Uh, lots of early collaborative projects um, like Click and Go, working with contemporary artists, working from the inside out and the outside in. 
And this is the Minneapolis Institute of Art who has a curatorial strategist on their staff to rethink the way that curators are working and engaging. And um, this is actually a recent period rooms project where they completely reimagine the histories of their period rooms to incorporate um, micro histories and untold stories. Is someone's slide, Anne? <laughs> okay, so my staff sent the slides, and I, I don't, I don't really know where they're from. <laughs> this, okay, so. They were good pictures. I put in two pictures of my team because I wanted to show you um, that my team reflects the audiences that we serve or that we want to serve. And uh, this is a Friday night and this is Bollywood night. Uh, and you can see in the background, the, the, the teens perform first and then, and then the pros. Uh, and I just happened to catch this picture and I'm like, it's, it's just beautiful. And then you look, we got a banner. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is how we close out every night. What we realized when we first started Friday nights is that we couldn't get people to go home. They wouldn't leave. Everyone was just like, ah, and we're like, what are we gonna do? And I told my dad, I'm like, well, we need to like do a Carol Burnett, like wiggle our ear, we need to play the A train or something. And they just looked at me like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I realized I just aged myself out of my analogies. So <laughs> Oakland loves a line dance. It, li it loves any line dance. It wants to, Oakland just wants to dance. So we always have a dance, part, a participatory dance moment, but we always close at 8.55 for the nine o'clock closure. We always play the Cupid Shuffle. We tried all sorts of uh, dances. The Cupid Shuffle is the one Oakland wanted. So literally at nine o'clock every Friday, the Cupid Shuffle, sh sh shake it, comes on and everyone runs out of the gap, wherever they are. They all hear the bass and they all go running to the dance floor and Oakland dances together. And at the end, they all cheer. They, I mean, they all cheer and this is, so cute. I, I feel like the moment I felt like the clock had transcended a moment was when you played the Cupid Shuffle and <laughs> Every, I looked and it was just, it was it's magical. Just, it, 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 it's, it's, it, 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 you have to see it every yeah. week. It's just too beautiful. <laughs> oh my gosh. Look at, okay, so we have an informal toddler dance party the first hour, hour and a half out there. It is hilarious. It is beautiful and everyone just sits out there and goes, the future's going to be all right. And uh, so at our 50th, our hella big 50th birthday party Friday night on September 20th, we gave out Museum of the People, and then of course it has our, our 50th logo on the back, little tiny tot t-shirts to every kid who danced on the dance floor. And, uh, and they all go out there, and sometimes the kids say, you know, it's my birthday, I'm gonna perform for Oakland. And they just go out on the dance floor. And one child, a, a true story went, uh, I, I saw the little, shir the, the little shirt that night, and I said, oh, did you dance? Uh, and, the, and the toddler dance party, well, dance party, he wasn't a toddler. Um, and he said, I won. And I just, my heart, I thought, oh my God, every child's going home thinking they won the tonight. <laughs> and it's beautiful. And this is my team now. Oh my goodness, they're so sweet. They're so smart, so good. And we are all from diverse backgrounds. So some, uh, a small minority are, tr are museum diehard professionals, but the majority of us come from other industries and are bringing other practices in to the museum with much respect and appreciation for the longevity of our museum. And I think I want to piggyback off of Cynthia's comment because I think what both Friday Nights and Art Mix does is have us be very intentional about the next generation of museum goers. We have to be very intentional because we can't assume that because our, you know, we're raising kids and they're, you know, that they're naturally going to have the same affinity to museums that we grew up with. Um, you all had an affinity because you're all here to some degree, right? But our children are distracted. I mean, they're into so many. I'm looking at Sadie because I know her child, Oscar. And Oscar, um, well, I remember the first time I saw Oscar, he was reading this thick book of code. He was 11. And I swear to God, this book was so thick. And I'm like, if I have to fight or compete with that book of code, code is winning. You know what I mean? Like, that's really hard. So I think we really have to be intentional. And this sort of shows all the different themes of Art Mix and just how we really try to focus on a variety of people. Um, 
this is Art Mix Tonight. So Grimm, um, these were the two sort of graphic images. Our marketing department is a really close partnership with us in Art Mix, um, and we're really excited. We work really hard to make sure Art Mix reflects um, you know, the diversity of Sacramento. Uh, this is, a, again, one of those, I think it was Mystique, Art Mix Mystique. Um, this one is really great. Uh, Cynthia mentioned this too about, and I think Jamie did, about sort of ushering in new emerging artists. You shouldn't have to die to be shown at the Crocker, like you really shouldn't. And so Jamie Vasquez is a photography artist and he um, did an installation, not an installation, excuse me, an art experimentation in this room um, where different people had the opportunity to be featured. And then um, this picture to the right is, was Art Mix Drag, where we had people who were into drag racing and people who were into drag dressing. And to see those two audiences come together was like amazing. Um, Right here is when we did Art Mix Zodiac, and you have um, UC Davis um, Chinese uh, lion dancing group um, facing off with the Ai Weiwei sculpture, um, which was just beautiful. And everybody was outside, and everybody sort of got it. Um, and then again, uh, we have CrocoCon every year. We do a couple of art mixes that are annual, and CrocoCon has like over 50 um, comic book illustrators featuring their work, doing live drawing, um, really helping people understand that, again, artists are alive and working in Sacramento, and you can support them, and it's so important that we do. Yeah, and then <laughs> one thing I wanted to say, CrocoCon, CrocoCon, CrocoCon. Um, <laughs> one thing. <laughs> So you shouldn't, you shouldn't let us out together. That's just a shame. But um, this is one, I wanted to end on this because one of the things I think is really important is um, it's not like either or. It, it has to be and, you know? So art mix is one thing out of a sort of, you know, suite of things that we do. And this is a photograph of Block by Block, which is our initiative that we have young people going out into the community, particularly underserved communities, implementing programs and inviting, personally inviting people to the museum. And when they invite them to the museum, they can invite them to a variety of things. But in un, un, I want to say um, undoubtedly, um, two things that people really respond to. One is our preschool programs because you know everyone's trying to do the best for their child and give them whatever they can to give them that leg up, and then art mix. And so. You know, it's it's really a menu and trying to make sure that we have something for everyone. And I'm really excited to be experimenting with these types of programs with colleagues that are in the room and sitting next to me and, and with the state providing um, support and with curatorial partners. So it's exciting, I think, and we're living in an exciting time. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, we'll turn it off back to Holly. Thank you all so much. This has been such a learning experience for me just to hear from all of you. And um, I am sure once this goes live on online, there will be a lot of dialogue there as well. So thank you again. And I hope you are all ready. I can hear the music out there. The program has started. So um, make sure you pick up one of these. It goes until 9 actually and everybody have their drink ticket because that's an important part of our mix <laughs> yeah your drink ticket yeah we have a variety of things happening and so um, the schedule will let you know where to go but uh, DJ Lady Grey we have um, bands happening we have art chat moments in the gallery um, we have a photography booth you know if, if you want it we have it so enjoy yourselves we'll be here to answer questions um, and just thank you so much for coming out I know tonight had a lot of competition and as Cynthia said it always competes with your couch so thank you thank you thank you <laughs> and if you don't have one of these white stickers then we'll we'll take care of you in just a minute so just make sure to come up to um, to one of us all right thank you all